Hi, welcome to Senior Moment Successful Aging. I'm your host, Mary Beals Ludka. I'm the director for the Area Agency on Aging at NACOG, and you can reach us toll free at 877-521-3500. Senior Moment Successful Aging is co-sponsored by the Division of Lifelong Learning at Yavapai College. Our co-producers are Connie Del Castillo, and you can reach Connie at 928-717-7607, and Allie Bateman from the Area Agency on Aging, and you can reach her at that toll-free number, 877-521-3500. And I want to welcome Chris Borman. Boy, I got the tongue twist. Yeah, I said I was going to say Chris Worman <laughs> Good to job. the show. Welcome. Thank nice, you. Nice Glad to, meet to meet you. you. Really nice to meet you, Chris. Thank you for joining us. I know you're with Ed Ventures uh, and Community Ed at the Yavapai College, but I want to step back just a little bit and talk about your background first okay. and where you came from. Well, I grew up in Illinois and I came out here to college kind oh. of on a lark. <laughs> Um, I had gone to college a year in Minnesota at my parents' alma mater and hated it <laughs> and was hunting for a new college. Mm -hmm. And I got a brochure in the mail one day in late September about Prescott College. And it turned out that the chairman of the board of trustee trustees of Prescott College had been my parents' geology professor when they were in college. And so we decided on the spur of the moment, let's try it out. And two days later, I was in Prescott on a standby flight enrolling at Prescott College. They had had a late cancellation, and there I was. That was 1967. Wow. 50 years ago. 50 years ago. So that brought you to, absolutely brought you to Arizona a long, long, long time ago. It did, and I just fell in love with the place, and I have not? lived around here ever since. How uh, can you not? I never get tired of the, the whole northern Arizona area. It's wonderful. It is beautiful, especially when, when you look at the geology alone. Exactly. You know, um, so it's not it's not unusual for someone who's in, interested in that. So, what was your major? I majored actually in social anthropology and minored in archaeology and geology. And social anthropology is studying people's cultures when they're still mm -hmm. alive, and archaeology is waiting until they're dead and digging through their garbage to try and figure out. <laughs> Who they were. So it's really studying cultures. Exactly. And we do exactly. have a lot of cultures here. Right yeah. here in northern Arizona we have a, a wide variety of cultures. So it's we do and, and I've worked a lot with a number of the tribes of northern Arizona mm -hmm. mostly involved with working through Yavapai College but some of it being a field archaeologist and I did several projects that were in Navajo country and the Navajos require you to hire Navajo help as mm -hmm. much as you can. So we had all sorts of assistance in the lab and assistance in the field that belonged to the Navajo tribe. And I was usually the only one that had actually studied live people culture rather mm -hmm. than dead people culture. <laughs> so I always got the job of being out there, making sure things went smoothly with the locals, as it were. How fun, though. Yeah, it was a fascinating time. And you said your wife also uh, worked at the college. She did. She was involved with Ollie. Actually, she was involved when it became Ollie. It started as Yavapai Learning Institute. Mm -hmm. And she was the administrator for, I don't remember exactly, eight or nine years. And that was the span when the first Ollie grant was received and the name officially changed over to Ollie rather than YLI. Yeah, I remember both. I remember about that time zone. So you've been at the college also for a very long time. I have. I started uh, 1981. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best things in life are accidents. In the fall of 1980, I was managing a large farm in Chino Valley, 850-acre uh, farm. That's large. And a couple moved to Chino Valley from Apple Valley, California, the Thielikis, that had a goat dairy. And they came to us for hay. So I'm sitting in Florence and Wesley's kitchen, and we're talking about how much hay they are going to want for their goat dairy the next year so that I can bale hay, especially for goats. Another whole story we won't get into. <laughs> and Florence popped up and said, do you know anybody that knows anything about Grand Canyon? And I said, well, I've done archaeology in Grand Canyon. I've backpacked all over Grand Canyon. What do you want to know? She said, I want somebody to come talk to a class next summer and take them on a field trip. So I said, okay. And I showed up and I talked to a class and I took them on a field trip. And this was the college's very first elder hostel program. 
And at the end of the program, the Dean of Continuing Ed called me up and said, these people loved you, will you come and teach for us? And so I started teaching part-time and that was my start at Yavapai College. So you really kind of started that whole thing with the Elder Hostel, the Adventures, because Adventures, is, what's the difference? Is it similar? Well, Adventures is mostly day trips. Okay. And there's, okay. A, there's a few overnights okay. and, and the college has done some week-long trips mm -hmm. and, and there's the overseas trips that have been started. And um, Elder Hostel was so successful for the college for a long time that in I don't remember the exact year, 93 or 94, somewhere back in there, I decided, well, why don't we do the similar thing and market it to our local people and gear it more towards local interests and where people are going to want to go locally. And so we started the Adventures program and it's still going. So tell me a little bit more about it. So it's part of the college. I know that it's much. part of the college. Uh -huh. And the idea is really kind of exploring our northern Arizona environment, the history, the cultures, the the landscapes, and most of the trips are single day. Mm -hmm. There's occasionally overnights, and of course there's the overseas adventures, which are a very different thing. And basically we go out for the day and we go someplace that usually is someplace that most people are not necessarily comfortable venturing out and exploring on their own. So it's a great way to go places that you otherwise might wonder if your car is going to make it or you're going to get lost on some little forest road or whatever might happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lead most of the trips and we go out and whatever it is, we talk about history, plants, rocks, Indians, you know, whatever, all sorts of things, geology and and uh, the trips are geared towards every sort of physical thing. So some of them are very sedentary, ride around in the van and get out and look at things all day and visit museums. And some of them involve some pretty serious backcountry hiking and exploring. I do several right. trips that involve hiking into some really wild places down in the western part of Grand Canyon that people otherwise would not be able to get into. So you, so you normally don't go to Montezuma Castle? Because we can do that on our own. No, so give sometime, me some examples of some of the, some of the days. Well, yeah. for instance, we do a trip where we go out Williamson Valley Road, which mm -hmm. not everybody in Prescott knows, goes all the way to Seligman. Yeah. And we go up to Seligman, we loop around, and we come back, Highway 89. And we stop at places that most people just don't know about. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an old stage stop off Highway 89. There's this weird rock letter sign hidden out in the junipers that was put in by an airmail contractor sometime during World War I that points to Ash Fork. It says Ash Fork 12 with a big arrow on the ground and like 16, 18 foot tall rock letters. Um, wow. We just stop at all sorts of interesting places and we talk about the history of that stretch of country, the old Camp Wallapai, the old Hardyville Road into Prescott and, and all of these things. And it's kind of I actually call this that series of trips exploring Yavapai County, going out to places that people otherwise, even if they drove the road up to Seligman, they wouldn't realize all the things that are along the side of the road. I've driven that road. I had no idea. Yeah. There's all sorts of interesting stuff. Oh, and you know where they are. Yeah. That's exciting. So, so you know, uh, this is, show is all about successful aging, you know, and, 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 and it's about being active and keeping our, our minds involved. So it sounds like you have a combination of both in adventures. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> and in classes. I mean, the, the community ed classes, a lot of those are the same thing, and I teach a number of them. And, you know, to my way of thinking, part of successfully aging is keeping your mind constantly going new places. Mm -hmm. And so... I could very easily teach all classes about things that I can just walk in there and do them. Mm -hmm. And some of the classes I teach are that way. I know the material so well and I've known it for so many years that I can walk in the door and no notes and no prep and print a fresh copy of the handouts and go for it. But at least once a year, I sit down and I say, I'm going to design a new class. And it might be something that I'm kind of familiar with the thing so I can do a good job of teaching it. But then I've got to go study. I have to learn everything. I don't like to go in a classroom and read off a page of notes. I like to go in a classroom and just talk and converse. 
And so then that forces me to have the self-discipline to go out and study whatever that new subject area is so that I can walk in and do that three week or five week or whatever long class mm -hmm. it is and not need any notes that I have learned it all and imprinted it in my own brain so I can talk about it with everybody. I admire that because it's true. We have to keep ourselves challenged. We do. And continue to learn. That's what we're here for. We do. Got to learn, learn, learn. You know what my I father did? Uh, he just passed away a couple of years ago, but he had a long, wonderful life. When he was 85 years old, he decided he wanted to become a Presbyterian minister. And he commuted, I don't remember the exact, 60 or so miles multiple times every week to go to school. And when he was 88, he was ordained. And when he was 89 and 90, he performed the marriage ceremonies for two of his granddaughters. Wow. And I've always looked at that and thought, you know, that's successful aging. That's not yeah. going, I'm old and it's time to stop doing things or mm -hmm. learning things or changing things or embarking on new adventures. It's, you know, this is something he wanted to do and it didn't matter to him that he was 85 years old. He just went and did it. I love and it because it's, it's a feeling, it's not a number. It is, you know, just it got, is. And it's, and it's mental. You know, everybody's body gives up eventually, and mine will. I'm, I count myself very blessed that I'm almost 70 and I can still mm -hmm. go out and, and lead hikes all over Grand Canyon. Yeah. And, and I, I have a handyman business. I shingle roofs and paint houses, and none of that bothers me. But I know, you know, my body's going to give it up. Everybody's body eventually does. But what really matters is keeping your brain going. And because that's where your true age is. It's not in whether you can still hike or ride a bike or climb ladders or whatever it is, or even if your eyes have given up on you or mm -hmm. something, it's what's going on in between your ears. That's where your age is. There you go. So, and it sounds like there is stuff for everybody though in, in the ad, um, adventures, because you said some of them could be sedentary, but some of them are very physical. So you actually teach classes at the college. Yes. And so, do you, it, is it through the regular college catalog that you find those? No, this is community ed. It's community ed. I, okay. I <laughs> once taught credit classes, archaeology and anthropology, mm -hmm. and I will never teach another credit class. I got really tired of having to grade tests and We term like papers. no tests, so no tests in yeah, community ed. Yeah, community okay. ed is no Good. tests, no term papers, <laughs> none of that stuff. You know, I have to know the material and mm -hmm. go into class and, <clears throat> pardon me, do an, an adequate job of presenting it and involve people and answer questions and do all of that. But then when I walk out the door, I don't have to carry a whole bunch of papers with me that have to be dealt with before the next class. And so, and and then there's there's a greater level of freedom in teaching a community ed class. Uh, when you teach a credit class, it's part of a larger curriculum. And those students have to walk out at the end of the class having learned certain key things. Mm -hmm. and, and those have to happen. In a community ed class, if I walk into a class and the people's interests are in a some collectively or in a somewhat different direction than I otherwise would have taught the class, Oh, I'm free to follow the interest of the students in the class to a degree. And that might be at the expense of some things I might otherwise have talked about within the time. But the students walk out the door feeling more fulfilled than if I had just dropped out a rote curriculum on them. So on the Ed Ventures and Community Ed, really the Community Ed is in the classroom. Exactly. Okay. And then the Ed Ventures is when we get to go out and do some things. You know, what are some other examples of like maybe an overnight adventure? Well, the one overnight that is really popular, we go up to Canyon de Chez. Oh, I bet. And on the way up, we go through Petrified Forest uh, and spend a little bit of time and partly to visit some prehistoric ruin sites because that whole trip is focused on ancestral Hopi and Navajo culture, both. And so we go through Petrified Forest and we stop at uh, a really interesting ruin site there. And then we go on to Canyon de Chez and we spend the part of the first day going along the rim and looking down in the canyon, seeing some of the old cliff dwellings at a distance. And then the following morning, we go into Canyon de Chez with a Navajo guide. Uh, the man we are using, which I will confess we found by accident. 
because of alphabetical order is Adam Teller, who was featured in October in Arizona Highways. So dig out your October 2017 Arizona Highways and you see a great story about Adam Teller, who is our guide. And he takes us up Canyon de Shea and Canyon del Muerto on a tour. And we visit a number of the prehistoric ancestral Hopi sites. But then we go to his own family's homestead, which is next to a cliff dwelling, well, more of a ruin than a cliff dwelling, called Antelope House, which is the name of his company. And there we meet a whole bunch of his family, and they cook fry bread, and they've got pottery and jewelry and things that people can purchase. And there's a pictograph above Antelope House of a bunch of antelope walking along a ledge, painted life-size. It was painted by his great-great-grandfather's brother wow. in 1863. And so it's a very cool trip because yeah. it becomes, at that end, a family-oriented trip from the Navajo culture side. And, and, and we walk away from it at the end with the people having a much better sense of who the Navajo are and how they live and how they relate and what their history has been like than almost anything else you could do. And then we always stop at Hubble Trading Post on the way home and uh, give people a chance to see one of the old historic trading posts. That sounds like a lot of fun. I, so how do I get involved? How, how, how do you sign up for adventures? <laughs> well, you can go on the college website and okay. track down to adventures okay. through the Community Ed link. And there's a catalog the Community Ed puts out I think three times a year, uh -huh. um, and that includes all the community ed classes plus all of the adventures programs. And uh, so you see a whole variety. We we go up to the old ruin sites around Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. We go over to the Verde River Canyon and ride the train and talk about the canyon. And and we do Williamson Valley and Crown King. And we go down to the Hacienda River Preserve. Uh, we take the the old back way down to Phoenix that hardly anybody knows about that goes through Agua Fria National Monument yeah. and down through Seven Springs and Cave Creek and into Phoenix. And we just go all kinds of different places and explore and have a wonderful time. So if I sign up for the adventure, you know, what kind of costs are, are involved? Well, there you've got me. I think the yeah. the basic day trips, I think, started about 139 or 149, okay. I mean, that's, somewhere you know, in there. Gives us a, a ballpark. So, and obviously it's going to be more yeah. for, for overnights. You know, I'll confess, when I was senior programs manager for 20 years at the college, I was buried in budgeting and costing out trips I and can organizing. Yeah. And now I'm hands off. I love it. I, I, I don't care what the trips cost. I don't care about any of that stuff. I love it. I've got the stuff I have to do on the trip as far as <laughs> keeping track of receipts and whatever. Yeah. And and then it all goes back to the office. and Let them do yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's their job now. I love it. You get so, to do the hands-on. And so you do. you do most or all of the adventures? Uh, <laughs> most of them. Most of most them? Most of them. And it's kind of, you know, it's it works out nicely for the college. You know, mm -hmm. I... I basically ran the department for 20 years and I've led hundreds and hundreds of trips. And so one of the things that I know is comfortable for the folks in the office is that they know that if something happens out on a trip, that they don't have somebody that's gonna panic and not know right. what order of things to deal with to make sure that it comes out all right. So in a sad thing that came out very well, we had a gentleman have a heart attack just a oh, couple dear. of weeks ago um and it all i mean dealing with it went so seamlessly he ended up being helicopter to prescott and he is fine good and he's planning on coming back to more trips but the trip actually finished out on schedule despite having wow. a heart attack and emts and helicopter and everything else and and you know the office knows that you know i'm just used to dealing with emergencies you got it together <laughs> over all the years there yeah. were so many of them that I imagine so. they're very matter of fact and I know it makes the groups feel more comfortable out in the field knowing mm -hmm. that they've got a, a a leader out there on the trip that has seen almost everything except the meteor come out of the sky and hit the van then you've seen a lot yeah. <laughs> you've seen a lot so I know also um, you're a musician I am you know, I wanted to talk about that. Let's see, you're a pianist? I am a pianist, keyboardist. Love it. I've uh, been playing since I was five years old. That's about when I started, and, but I'm uh, not good. 
<laughs> well, I think I'm pretty good. You must be. And um, I, I learned playing by ear when I was really little, and then my parents got me regular classical mm -hmm. piano lessons, and I took classical for eight or nine years, something like that. So I, I'm in some ways an unusual musician. I'm totally comfortable improvising and playing by ear and and you know reading you know chord chart music and making something out of it but at the same time i can read beethoven and mozart and so on because i've had that classical training and i know how to score music and so on i've written quite a bit of music this is for you to have this is a cd of original piano music that wow in a way i look I at it, it as gifted to me um, back in the 70s, I did two years in a row, these very long multi-week backpacking trips in Grand mm -hmm. Canyon, uh, during which I was doing backcountry archaeology for na the National Park. And I kept hearing music all the time. And what this is, is my taking that music that I kept hearing in the background of things all the time and turning it into actual keyboard pieces about Grand Canyon. So I hope you enjoy it. I and cannot the, wait to listen to this. And the photo that is partially on the back and shows more completely inside yeah. um, is a photograph I took from the southern tip of a place called Powell Plateau, which is one of the more remote reaches of Grand Canyon uh, that I took in the midst of one of those long backpacking trips. Where would someone find this if they'd like to, to purchase it? Um, I've got a website, www.goathillmusic.com. Go Tell Music. Go Tell Music. Okay. And, um, but you can also get it from you know, iTunes and Amazon and oh, excellent. Spotify. Mackerel, Mackerel Sky. Mackerel Sky. I have a couple a of other CDs name. out there. Thank you so much. So I hope you I dabble this. at the piano. I mean, mm -hmm. I can read music, but I'm not a good improviser. That was hard for me uh, because I was so strictly taught. You know, I read anything, mm -hmm. but and so so to have both sides of that is is very, it is rare, and what and very and that's a talent. Yeah. I cannot wait to listen to this. And music is just there are so many different forms of music. Yes, there are. And I keep learning new ones. Um, I had never played blues or country for that matter. Uh -huh. And, Which are my favorite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and about, I don't know, I'd say four or five years ago, my wife and I have a travel trailer, and we travel all over the country. We're mm -hmm. gone probably three months any average year. Nice. And uh, we were at a KOA in Bluffton, Indiana, and I carry a keyboard with me when I'm traveling. And I drug my keyboard out, and I was setting it up under the awning to play. And the guy across the way walks out the door with a little lamp and a guitar. And he looks at me and I look at him and he says, do you play the blues? And I said, no, but I'll learn. And so he came over with his guitar and he said, this is how they work. And within 10 minutes, we were playing together like we were a polished band. And we ended up with a whole audience of people drinking beer and having a good time. And then I learned how to play the blues. Awesome. And, um, and then I had um, a guy call me up a few years back and asked me if I knew how to play country music and I said no and he said you want to come join our country band and I said sure sure why not and so I played in a country band out in Chino Valley for a couple of years called Country Pride and and learned how to do country music and and so always kind of learning new and different things yeah, and and music is a great way learning a new piece of music right now I'm doing some Bach conventions mm -hmm. because that you know you got to do the left and right and counter sync them and and that, I figure that's a good brain exercise for me. Ex exactly, exactly, <laughs> it's good exactly. Brain exercise. Music is good brain exercise, yeah, and, and I write quite a bit of music and I play pretty often for Unity Church in Prescott. Okay. I'm one of the regular Sunday service keyboards on a couple of Sundays a month and nice. do a lot of the special music and I've written some of the church's music. Last Christmas the church did a. The choir did a piece that I had written. Wow. So, yeah, music is just fun. There's all all different kinds. It's a universal language, too. And like you said, when you set your keyboards up, all of a sudden you're attracted, you know. And, and I also like the fact that you heard that music in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Because I'm that way. When I'm in nature, I hear music. 
Now I have a weird story about that. The first time I heard music in Grand Canyon, I was backpacking with a friend of mine and we were in a really remote canyon that probably nobody's heard of called Nankoweep Canyon, way off at the northeast end of the National Park. And it had a little stream running down it. And we were sitting there eating lunch and I heard this really simple distant melody, like somebody had a radio a couple of corners around the canyon going, da 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 and just repeating they over and over you. like a loop. Yeah. And and I heard it all day. And finally at evening we were camped down by the river and we had a little illegal campfire going because nobody would have seen it up there. You're not supposed to build those. But we we're help. sitting there we're <laughs> sitting there cooking our dinner and 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 I looked at my backpacking partner and I said, you know, I've been hearing music all day and and my backpack partner looked back and said, well, I've been hearing music all day too. And it kind of goes, da, 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 da. And they were hearing the same music that I was. I have really? no explanation for how that would work. Huh. And, and, but my experience is different parts of the canyon have different melodies playing. And you know, when I lead one hike in particular, um, we did it a couple of weeks ago. We have another one ha coming up in early December called the Diamond Creek Hike. And we hike up this tributary canyon and it keeps, it starts out really wide and open in this blasted rock bottom and this little tiny lost stream. And it just keeps getting narrower and narrower. And finally you're back in the spot where the cliffs go up eight or 900 feet of all this black and you know, gnarled looking rock and the stream is almost filling it wall to wall at that point and, and there's a little waterfall and we stop there and eat lunch. Well, because there's no way for anybody to get lost after lunch, I always let everybody take off and walk their own pace and I follow them out so that I just make sure everybody you know, gets nobody, out. nobody breaks their leg and gets left behind or something bizarre. Yeah. And, and uh, But every time I always let the group go and then I sit there at that waterfall for about 10 minutes and listen to the music and then take off and follow everybody out. It's this little kind of quiet time. And every time I do it, I thank my lucky stars that I'm so blessed to be able to hike into a place like that and share it with all sorts of people that would never see it and just how beautiful and priceless that one little place is. And how beautiful and priceless that you get to do this all the time and share that with so many of us. So if we want to sign up and go on an adventure with Chris Werman, mm -hmm. you need to get on that Yavapai College website and find Community Ed, find the adventures, stay young, stay active. Exactly. Of course, I can't say stay young, stay healthy. But you can say stay young you, up here. Yeah, and you know, stay or young Dennis Garvey here. will give me a really hard time because he's like, don't say that. I'm like, okay, Dennis, I didn't say that. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna stay with it and keep the music in our lives. And I really thank you for being here. It was a pleasure, and thank you very much for this gift. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you Chris very Werman, much. thank you very much for being with us today on Senior Moment, Successful Aging. I'm Mary. Until next time.